being a lifelong learner is um, continually pursuing um, both personal and professional development. And our whole life is an education. So just because we've graduated or we've finished a course or um, we've left an education doesn't mean that we stop learning. Um, and the fact that we all work in education means that we need to um, like say, continually um, strive to, to develop and um, to be flexible and diverse and to be promoters of the concept of being a lifelong learner. So we're all here um, at the summer, let's see if I get this right, the summer educational exchange program or the CD program. And one of the things that we've been looking at over the last couple of weeks is the um, is how to relate teaching theory and practice through a reflective method of teaching. Um, so reflecting on um, past actions and events and taking a conscious look at our emotions, experiences, actions, um, and our existing knowledge and using it to, well, taking that knowledge and experience back to our home countries and implementing it into our professions. Um, I say professions because, as we know, um, even though we're all, we all work in the field of ELT education, we're not all teachers. So I, for example, work as an ELT editor, and Kenya is the state coordinator of the National English Program in the state of Mexico, we're both in, in Mexico. Um, and we'll talk a little bit more about our specific roles a little bit later, um, but for now, taking us back to this idea of the reflective method of teaching. And the first stage of reflective, uh, of reflective practice is retraining. So here's the game for some of us. <laughs> Fresh on the plane from Mexico. Um, can everyone raise their hands if you went to school? <laughs> so before we even take our careers into consideration, um, we can see that none of us are blank canvases um, when, when, we, when we begin our journey, I guess. Um, so a trainee's professional actions during the pre-training stage are based on existing um, conceptual schemata or mental constructs, which are essentially the ideas, beliefs, and attitudes that we all have. Um, and they can be shaped by a number of things, by um, culture, um, by social factors, um, geography, um, personality, and they're shaped by, by many things. Um, and it's essentially, I guess, our behavior in any particular situation that's consistent with you know, the ideas that we, that we have. So when something happens, we all already have an automatic idea um, of how to respond to it, of how important it is, um, how to solve a situation that comes up. Um, so we have these ideas. Um, if, we have, um, if our ideas were different, how would the trainee's professional actions change? And we move to the next stage of The second stage is uh, the one we are in now. Um, I don't remember exactly the day I was invited to come here to this summer course. That uh, I have in mind that I'm a teacher. And uh, I have in mind that I always like to be learning something different. Uh, when we were thinking about these two stages, I mean, there is always uh, something I need or want to learn. So besides the excitement of coming to the States, I said, what it was this course about? So that's why we put a picture, number one, when we were right here almost two weeks ago, we, were, we felt like trainees again. It doesn't matter, we have different experiences. Some of you work with teachers, some of you work with students, some of you deal with another kind of my job is have with teachers and have with paperwork, and that's also education. And I'm learning a lot, and it's as important as teaching. The role of a teacher is as important as the role of a person doing a paperwork to ask somebody to come to this summer work, camp, or whatever you want to call it. So we, our expectations were different. But anyhow, we 
maybe jump at the beginning from stage one to stage two. We are in a professional development stage. What does that mean? Normally, it takes two, th two things. The received knowledge, all of us bring a magic box. Uh, tricks, knowledge, you study. How many of you, of you study to become a language teacher? Who is study to become a language teacher? Okay, most of you who did not study to become a language teacher. <laughs> so that's our connection here. I was an elementary school teacher and I became a language teacher. So my path was a little bit different and now um, I haven't studied a master in language teaching, but I'm into this. So part of my knowledge has been received at the school. But most of it has been through these seminars. I have, enough, uh, I have of course, I have a proper training how to teach English and so on. But basically, most of my knowledge about PLT is a received knowledge. But the other part comes from the second one, that is the experiential knowledge. Most of the ideas, most of the things you have been doing here, when somebody gives us an idea or nice breakers or storytelling, we say, oh yes, I have done this. Oh, I don't know how to do this. Or, ah, I think I'll improve this. So this is experiential learning. So the connection is important because if we come here with a closed mind, thinking about, oh, I know everything. I'm the best of the best. Super. No, that's not, that's not a, a good idea. So basically, what we were thinking about how we can implement this back home, of course, is giving this uh, uh, transmit, not transmit, not just receiving, uh, copy this chapter, read it, and talk to you later. No, I think that's, uh, and I'm, we are going to show you in the quotation we mark, is that, of course, we are taking uh, specific steps to share this experience with God. But first, I think it's important, in my case, that I deal with teachers most of the time, is to uh, let them know you have to be learning and learning all the time. It's never ending. I mean, you start one day, the next day you continue, and you learn even from students. Um, when we talk about experiential learning, well, it takes into account so many things. Next one. I work for that program. It's a national policy in Mexico. It's for public schools. Um, it's a very interesting, it's a challenge for the country, and I work for one of the 32 states. And what is the challenge? What are the standards in my program? That's one of the things I, I was really interested in when we were looking at the way of doing the presentations. We have to encourage teachers to uh, get three standards. The first one is to know the language. Student teachers should know the language. It sounds like it's obvious. Well, it's obvious, but it doesn't, it's not happening. It's, um, I mean, in Mexico, we have been teaching English from the 50s. And when the students leave secondary school, uh, if they are asked, they say, do you speak English? They say, what? <laughs> <laughs> and some other will say, I understand it, but I cannot speak it. And it's true, because it has been exposed only three years. So this is the first standard, of course it's there. We are working uh, a lot of that, getting better teachers, better brief service teachers, and motivate them to become better service teachers. The second standard is use the, using the language. So we have changed the approach. We have been talking here about the different approaches, where in Mexico we are using the exploration learning, where we expose the kid to the language. But of course, if we don't have teachers, that speak or use the language, it's impossible to get to the second standard. But the third standard that's what we call my attention is being with the language. It means using the language in the appropriate context. And I, I start always with this very simple example. Using please and thank you. How you can use it in the appropriate context, in the right time. So can we get those standards in the program? Yes, we can use it, but we need to uh, take the teachers into this reflective model to make aware of them that they can do it. 
Because if they say, oh no, I cannot make my kindergarten students to think, of course I can. Of course I can. Well, 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 well. And I start speaking in Spanish. No, you say, please, thank you. Please. How do you say? So we start giving examples of how you do and reach those standards in the program I work. And if I be I work as an editor at the University of Data and University. And I'm an editor, so I don't write materials, I edit the materials that the authors send in. Um, and the materials are students' books, workbooks, um, multi rom readers, teachers' guides, all the materials um, And so we work closely with. Um, yeah, yeah. Um, so a lot of our professional standards overlap um, those which he you know, just, just went through. Um, a, a part of his job is to provide training um, to enable teachers to do the best job possible, and essentially our job is to provide materials that help teachers to do the best job possible. So we want to read you our mission statement, um, which is to provide high quality English language materials and promote strong universal values that develop social responsibility, cooperation, and global awareness. And our tagline, or the tagline of, of University of Data Publishing, is improving English, developing people. So it's not just about language learning, it's about developing people. Um, so taking into account our bringing it back to the idea that Hino explained about received and experiential knowledge and try and link it to the course that we've been doing here, here in Dayton. Um, practice, we've been referring to practice as the what um, during the course here. So what, what happened, what did it mean to, um, what were my expectations in the beginning? The first workshop that he took part in was um, and a lot of um, the other groups have already mentioned this workshop because it was a really, it was a really interesting one. So I think we all went with a preconceived idea of what an icebreaker is. And um, certainly speaking for myself, I think a lot of people were left thinking something different. Um, we received knowledge, but in the very short space of, space of time of the class, we participated in no less than six or seven. And um, and one of my reflections after this was I was amazed to see how icebreakers can do so much more than break the ice. So the basic definition of an icebreaker, I guess, is something that gets people talking or breaks down inhibitions between people. Um, but what was so interesting through practicing the different icebreakers in this workshop was to see how much more they can do and how each icebreaker can have a different functional goal. Um, and that they can be used um, to introduce, to team build, to connect, to energize, to be focused, to we've seen a lot of this already. Um, and also that they were so much fun. And this can be implemented, I guess, I'm, I'm having so much fun, I don't quite realize that I'm producing a particular grammar point or I'm using a particular vocabulary. And so that was my reflection on, on ice cream. And my reflection is that. So I think when we ask teachers through an activity and some that you have already mentioned in the different presentations, we are thinking. And uh, I will take some examples from one of the sources we, we were given. Is, uh, some of the teachers I work with, uh, they will say, that would never work with my class. It's not that very positive. But some others, but some others, We'll say, I'll try that later, and I'll see how it works. But if we only give the received knowledge, and there is no experiential knowledge, so it's not worth. Maybe for us, I mean, the, the lineup of activity or the other icebreakers, I, I, I think I have to try them. And maybe the first time I will make a mistake, and I will do instructions, not correct, and the class will be a disaster. But I'll try it twice and three times. So in my case, my job is to convince teachers by doing them. So I have to create, based on what we have been doing here, a workshop about icebreakers. 
So this is the first thing. So I think uh, not only as uh, we put together both poles, is an icebreaker is more than break the ice. Because from there, even relationships I and mean, friendships can start. Oh, I talk. I bring was not really nice. And now she's really nice. And so on. That's what people think. Because sometimes we see faces, and we haven't spoken to the others and everything that they are talking. Okay, that's not me. That's not even when I'm going to sleep. <laughs> it's not my picture, but anyway, what a reflection. I mean, how to make teachers reflect when maybe this topic will sound very, very boring for some of that was it. But we learn a lot in the workshop of critical thinking that is not. I love the reading and the way they took us into thinking. Uh, Instead of saying, what is the color of the horse, or what is the color? No, no those kind of questions, and kids can answer those questions. But I have to go back first and say, teachers, you, you, first think. Because if you don't live the experience, if you don't see it, if you don't get into that trouble, teachers will not feel the same. They will say, like, this question again, no, that will never work in the time. But if they do it, Maybe they will, of course, as, as we are going to be doing, we have to adapt into our context, the setting. I mean, I work with my, the groups of uh, my teachers. In preschool, they are up to 30 kids in preschool. In elementary school, they are up to 50. And in secondary school, the same, up to 50. So, of course, I need, I know that the teacher will say, no, no, this is impossible to be 50 years. And I think, okay, why not? Just tell me why not. This is the first question. Tell me why not. Maybe it's the language. Maybe he is not really into learning more. So how we can do it? So the first question is how we can get into reflection and give the science. So we went to the so what. Now we are aware of those problems because we can spend so many days and hours complaining about everything. No electricity, no computers, nothing. We can spend it a whole day doing it. No. Next one. Now what? Well, we have a lot of strategies that we have learned here. Some of you have given us very good examples. And I think I'm going to stick kind of presentations so to use them because they are very useful. And I'm sure that's the best way to learn. I don't have all the answers. Me as a, my job, I'm not a presenter. Basically, I'm a teacher who now is in charge trying to convince them. My job is to convince teachers to be better teachers. So, are you a good teacher? Do you consider yourself a good teacher? If yes, why? And if not, why? And how can I help you? Like in McDonald's. May I help you? I don't know what they say because they speak too fast. I have a So, but, uh, now what? Well, the now one is, um, and it comes my first uh, quote from the, the workshop of critical thinking. Being a good listener makes you a good critical thinker. If we don't listen, and sometimes as a teacher we don't listen, because we don't have time, because we have 50 kids. I'm sure now you are thinking about something else, and don't know what else. But it happens. And sometimes in, at school, when a kid approaches uh, or have a question, we say, oh, we don't have time. We are out of time. So let's find a time. How? I don't have the answers. What would you do in your cases? I don't know. It would change. Do you, you don't have any answers. Are you, but first, are you a good listener? And as uh, uh, Gina mentioned at the beginning, it, it is not the impact only as a professional, but also as, as, a, as a person. Am I a good listener with my friends? With my family? Do I really listen to them? Because it, it's, it influences our job. The way we are outside of the school sometimes, it influences. So I like this quote from uh, the workshop of Radio Home. Um, my reflection was, it's interesting to see how once you are aware of it, it's so easy and seamless to incorporate critical thinking into your lesson. I think that the terminology for critical thinking quite overwhelming, scary even, when it's used out of context. But 
But when we um, saw it in the workshop and we kind of, it was seamless. And before, like, before we knew it, we were thinking critically without necessarily being aware or doing it consciously, if that makes sense. So, um, critical thinking is already an important part of our materials at the University of Jane Publishing. Um, but as we've been talking about, the world of education is ever changing. So part of our job, what we need to do is to um, to be constantly aware and to keep moving with um, to, with the demands and um, to keep up with the, the demands. Um, so there's definitely a lot of food for thought in the workshop um, and things to think about to incorporate and improve on the materials that we already have. Um, so the, um, the stages of reflective teaching come together to form a goal, which is professional competence. And um, I think it was Wallace um, described this goal as a moving target. So every step that we take towards it, it takes two steps back, um, which again just reiterates the fact that we need to be constantly um, developing, being lifelong learners to, to be able to keep up with this moving target of Yeah. And in the last um, slide, well, this is really like this. And it matches with our job. Uh, Gina is going to do it one way when she look at the materials that we are receiving. And my job is to think about strategies how we can be jumping from stage one to stage two. It doesn't matter. It's not a matter of the age. There are very good teachers who, when they are even they are experienced, they want to learn more. We have a very good example here. Child, for example, <laughs> <laughs> that we are very close to the end. In a number of years, maybe for sure, but there are very young people here that I consider myself most of the time a trainee. I always want to learn. That's the way I, I can share something. So it sounds very abstract, but it is not when it comes with examples through the, all the workshops we have been giving here. So examples are there, they are in the presentations in the materials we, uh, we have. Um, I just put it up this uh, binder with all the materials. This is called my portfolio from the seminar. So it's a way to organize, otherwise the papers will go somewhere when I'm hacking. But I call it my portfolio, this uh, uh, summer educational program. So, and it's now, for me, it's not complicated to tell teachers how you can do this and how they will take you to professional competences. I will suggest, and I found why I was reading this, four simple words that are, maybe you like it or not, maybe you do it or not. Um, the first one is think. The second one is talk. Read and ask. I think if we do this, not simple because it's not that simple we say sometimes in that way, but if we think, talk, read, and ask, we uh, are using this uh, model that is taking us to the professional competence. So for me, and uh, uh, I think as for, for China, this uh, summer course has been taking us into a professional competence, into another step. Uh, I, of course, I have to read a lot about many things, but I'm very interested. I'm going to be using this strategy the next school year because uh, my decision allows me to share this. The other strategy is we are going to incorporate literal circles in what's one of the policies for public schools in Mexico. Uh, yes, as Chai mentioned, uh, the population of students in my state is 4 million kids. So I hope I don't, I would like to reach the 4 million, but if I can reach 10,000 or, I don't know, as many as possible, but they get the proper idea of how interesting and good are uh, liberal circles, it will, uh, it will, I will be happy not just because of me, but because it will help the development of the kids. So we can do that. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you very much.